So, we've learned about how electoral votes are divided up among the states. Now let's look at how electoral votes are awarded to candidates within each state. Most states use a system known as winner-take-all. It's just like it sounds. The candidate who wins the most votes in a given state takes all that state's electoral votes. This winner-take-all system is not required by the Constitution. And it's not without controversy. In every state that uses winner-take-all, a candidate only needs to win more votes than the other candidates to win all that state's electoral votes. But they don't need an outright majority. That means a candidate can win a state even if most voters prefer someone else. Here's an example from the presidential election of 1992. In a three-way race, Bill Clinton eked out a win with 37% of the vote in Nevada. That means 63% of Nevadans voted for one of the other candidates. But because Bill Clinton received more votes than any of the others, he won all of Nevada's electoral votes. Some people say that winner-take-all means that votes cast for losing candidates just don't matter. If all electoral votes go to one candidate, those who voted for the runner-up don't have their votes reflected in the national tally when the electoral votes are counted. Some argue that those voters are effectively ignored. A second concern with winner-take-all is that it gives disproportionate influence to swing states. To understand swing states, you have to understand what is not a swing state. In every election cycle, there are some states where it's easy to predict which presidential candidate is going to win right from the start. Consider Kentucky. Based on historical trends, a Republican candidate for president starts his or her campaign knowing they are going to win the state of Kentucky. And a Democratic candidate knows that they are almost certainly going to lose. As a result, candidates from both parties have little to no motivation to campaign in Kentucky. They see it as a waste of time and money. Most states are predictable in this way. That's why some people call them spectator states. Because after the primaries, they're on the sidelines of the election. Swing states are where the action is. These are states that are less predictable in their voting habits. Their electoral votes are up for grabs. Campaigns end up focusing almost entirely on swinging these states to their side. In 2016, there were 14 swing states. These 14 states ended up hosting 94% of all candidate campaign appearances during the general election. And during the last month of the election, 99% of all campaign ad spending happened in just these 14 states. This strikes some people as unfair. In 2016, swing states contained a third of the American population. Their population was older and whiter than the country as a whole. And the key industries that mattered to these states differed from the rest of the country. And yet, they got almost all of the candidates' attention. Research indicates that swing states may get preferential treatment for federal spending and from federal policy. All this may lead to voters in spectator states feeling like their votes don't count as much. That may explain why voter turnout in swing states is often 10 to 15 percent higher than spectator states. Now, some people don't feel like this is really a problem. For one thing, which states are the swing states is not written in stone. Which states are swing states changes over time. If voters in a spectator state are consistently ignored or taken for granted by their party, they may shift to the other party. A national popular vote would bring an end to the swing state spectator state dynamic. But here's another proposal. What if states awarded electoral votes proportionately to the top two candidates rather than to just one? Say the Republican candidate received 55% of the vote in Texas. In a winner-take-all process, that candidate will receive all 38 of the state's electoral votes. But if Texas awarded electoral votes proportionately, the Democratic candidate will receive 45% of the electoral votes, 17.1 of them to be precise. And if the Republican candidate received 45% of the votes from California, that candidate will receive 24.75 electoral votes there, instead of zero. This would hold true for all states, with each candidate getting a fraction of the electoral votes in proportion to the share of the voters who supported them. This system is known as fractional proportional. With fractional proportional, the votes for the top two candidates in every state would be reflected in the national tally of electoral votes, rather than just one candidate as currently happens with winner take all. And there would no longer be swing states and spectator states, because candidates would have a reason to fight for every vote in every state. Some support fractional proportional because it doesn't eliminate the smaller state advantage or change federalism like a national popular vote would. This is also why some supporters of a national popular vote don't think fractional proportional goes far enough. Smaller states would maintain an electoral advantage 
though smaller states are pretty evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats, so that's not likely to create any partisan advantage. On the other hand, some argue that winner-take-all has its merits. After all, it maximizes the support a candidate can get from a state they have the most votes in. A fractional proportional system may also increase the chances of no candidate reaching the 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency if a strong third-party candidate emerged. If no candidate reaches a majority of electoral votes, then the Constitution requires that the House of Representatives pick the next president in a contingent election, where each state would only get one vote. That would move us even further away from the idea of one person, one vote, since a smaller state like Rhode Island would have the same one vote as a large state like California.